Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Guterres. You've uh, really framed the discussion, I think, uh, very well, and I'm very grateful to you for, for doing that. Uh, now we have uh, the opportunity to hear from uh, two other ambassadors with deep experience in, in the U.S.-Mexican relationship. Uh, Arturo uh, Sarakan uh, is currently an international strategic advisor and consultant based here in Washington uh, and a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings uh, and a distinguished visiting professor at the Annenberg School of Public Diplomacy at USC. Uh, he is uh, the grandson and son of Armenian and Catalan conflict refugees in Mexico, hence the name Sarokan, and uh, has served as a career diplomat in the Mexican Foreign Service for 22 years, where he received the rank of career ambassador in 2006, somewhat like Ambassador Tony Wayne, who also achieved that rank. Uh, Arturo has held numerous positions in the uh, Foreign Ministry in Mexico, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs. Uh, he was uh, responsible for Latin American regional coordination mechanisms. In 1993, he was posted here to the embassy uh, in Washington at the onset of the negotiations with Congress over uh, the NAFTA agreement. Uh, he served first as Chief of Staff to the Ambassador, uh, and in 2000, uh, he then went back to Mexico where he served as the Foreign Secretary Chief of Policy Planning in the Foreign Ministry. Uh, he joined the campaign of President-elect Calderon, and after his uh, victory uh, in February 2007, he was appointed Ambassador of Mexico in the United States where he served for six years, until 2013. Uh, he was, I like this part, the youngest and longest serving Mexican ambassador I in think, Washington. I think the only one with you the youngest now. <laughs> I think. He's younger? I think. You need to update your resume. I think. <laughs> Except for Geronimo. <laughs> uh, Tony Wayne, an old friend and colleague from the State Department, uh, has been a US and American diplomat for, uh, since 1975 to 2015. As I said, he, he uh, attained the highest rank of career ambassador in the US Foreign Service in 2010. He's currently a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a senior non-resident advisor at the Atlantic Council and at the Center for Security and International Studies. The only think tank that's missing from here, Tony, is uh, Brookings. But. Well, <laughs> happy to work on <laughs> uh, Tony uh, served as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from 2011 to 2015. Uh, he was also Deputy U.S. Ambassador in Kabul and U.S. Ambassador in Argentina. Uh, he worked for three Secretaries of State as Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, which is where... I came across him. Uh, so we have two uh, ambassadors who have deep experience in the relationship. And uh, I think um, what I'd like to do, since we don't have a lot of time for the discussion, is ask you, first of all, from your perspectives, how serious is this crisis in the relationship? You want to start us off, Arturo? Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you today and to join my good friend and uh, counterpart, Tony. Um, we were discussing in the room before we moved in here that um, many times people tend to forget that Ambassador is uh, successful also in terms of how he or she can work with counterparts in the other capital city and the way that Tony and I work together, um, sometimes playing the role of good cop and bad cop with our own respective bureaucracies. Uh, was a very important component of, of the, I think, the success that, that we had during our tenure. So it's great to be with you, and could only more welcome. Um, I couldn't think of someone better prepared to undertake the challenge that you will be facing in the coming uh, months and weeks uh, in this city. Look, um, 
And I, I, I wrote a pretty straightforward op-ed in the Washington Post when um, uh, the secretaries of uh, foreign affairs and, um, and the economy were ambushed by the tirade of tweets and statements by uh, President Trump, which led to the cancellation of President Peña Nieto's trip to DC uh, at the onset of the administration. Um, there hasn't been a point as dire as this one in the bilateral relationship since the 1980s. And in the 1980s, there were two factors that explain the nature of what has still and still is, despite this critical moment, is the nature of the bilateral relationship between Mexico and the United States. One was an issue which was completely uh, unrelated to the bilateral relationship per se. It was Central America. Uh, what happened was that the top... Mexican foreign policy priority at the time, Central America, collided with one of the top foreign policy priorities of the US administration, the Reagan administration, Central America. And that really contaminated the way Mexico and the United States understood one another. And in the midst of this, you had the abduction and assassination of DH and Enrique Camarena in Mexico, and the relationship nosedived. Um, we hadn't seen something as bad as that in these past 20 years until these last months, and in particular, uh, this first month of the administration. Um, I'm, I'm more encouraged than I was two months ago because I think that um, the administration has started to understand that the slash and burn approach to Mexico um, is counterproductive. Um, but I, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Uh, I, I, I'm a recovering diplomat, so I can say things that Canonimo probably cannot say. Um, even, even though, again, I say things are less dire than they were in uh, the middle of February, um, the relationship is at a low point, especially because the last two decades fundamentally transformed the way Mexico and the United States understand one another, and the government-to-government -government dynamics, which are still there and which is still strong. We have the challenge that the president still has to designate 400-plus, uh, uh, nominate 400-plus uh, officials that will need Senate confirmation and for a relationship like the Mexico-US relationship that touches absolutely every department and agency in Washington, D.C., not having the number twos and number threes that carry the water in the day-to-day -day relationship with Mexico has a very profound impact. Now, having said that, I think the muscle tone of the day-to-day government-to-government relationship is pretty solid. Um, but what we saw these first weeks uh, as the administration came into office was very troubling. Um, I think that we've now, by convincing or imposing radio silence on the president's Twitter feed regarding Mexico, I think we've allowed both sides and both governments and government officials to start navigating and establishing a roadmap for what comes ahead obviously paramount importance, the NAFTA renegotiation, which we now finally with the official US notification to Congress and the 90 day clock ticking will take us into late August, early September for the formal uh, 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 start of the negotiations. But uh, I think the breathing room that has been created by the radio silence on Mexico related issues coming from the White House is what has pr precisely allowed uh, cabinet officials uh, both in Mexico and here to start working together and trying to plot what comes next in the relationship. How, how, how did they manage to achieve that Twitter silence? Do you know? <laughs> I know it's not been. I know it's not been easy, but kudos to those who've been able to do it. Yeah, it could be replicated and uh, scaled. It would be quite an improvement. Uh, Tony, what's your take? Well, so to build on what Arturo said. Um, what was shocking to those of us who've been working on this relationship for a while is that we would really have 20 plus years of constant work to improve that relationship, to overcome the legacy of history where in the 1980s we were called distant neighbors because we were distant from each other even though we were right next to each other. And we'd had all sorts of success. And if you think about it, there's no relationship that touches the daily lives of American citizens more than does the U.S.-Mexico relationship. So when we started having this very critical rhetoric coming out of first the campaign and then the new administration, it was really, it was a shock. And it was a shock also because it wasn't 
reflective of the reality of the relationship. And then we saw in Mexico the resurrection in response of that anti-Americanism that we had seen in the past. So that was very worrisome to all of us who had spent years working on this. As Arturo said, very fortunately, people started working, talking to each other, really reflecting on the facts, that facts that we trade a million dollars a minute, that there are a million border crossings each day without any problems, legal border crossings, so many other things that tie people together. And those who benefit from this relationship started being willing to speak out. And in this sense, I praise American farmers. They, were, they and their groups really started saying, wait, what are we doing here? This is our third largest market in the world. We need this market. Why are you endangering? Um, the other day I ran across when, they, when NAFTA was signed, one of the figures the Heritage Foundation came up with was 700,000 American jobs in the relationship with Mexico. Well, it's now 4.9 million American jobs dependent on directly that commercial, dependent. directly and indirectly, but in that, in that trade, investment, commerce nexus. That is not we've, the, a, fa a factor in which we've lost a lot of jobs in net for the economy. And you'll hear a little bit later, I know Gary Huffbauer and others are gonna talk about that. The economic studies have just shown that NAFTA has not been the negative uh, agreement that it's been portrayed as. And yet, President Trump, this is to both of you really, President Trump exposed a, 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 a nativist kind of anger or angst that found expression in the relationship with Mexico. So, right. so there was something there. Uh, and and uh, if that's the case, uh, and, and what it was was a kind of grievance against Mexico that he gave expression to, how real is that and how, how can it be dealt with? Well, I do think there is certainly in a certain segment of the American population, there is a feeling of grievance and a number of them have blamed NAFTA for this. I don't think correctly, because as studies have shown, it's really been automation, new technology, and some trade, but not really within NAFTA, trade with China and elsewhere that have contributed to job losses. And there were not many alternatives for a certain segment of these people. So the, the solution, however, is to try and help this segment of people understand the reality, and then if we can make NAFTA better, as Ambassador Gutierrez was saying, let's, let's do that. I, 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 I would disagree slightly. I, I don't think it's, it's a grievance with Mexico. I think it's a grievance with how increasingly uh, working uh, middle classes in America feel that trade and the changing demographics of towns and cities and, 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 and the societies in which they lived in are tapping into certain triggers of fear and uncertainty. And the fact that Mexico is part of NAFTA and that we have about 5 million undocumented, of the 11 million undocumented uh, 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 people in the United States, 5 million of those are of Mexico, that sort of provides an easy platform to scapegoat Mexico and use Mexico as, a, as an electoral piñata, which is what Donald Trump did, I think, uh, in, in a deplorable and demagogic way during the, the, the campaign. But, but I think the, the, the challenge is, one, something that successive Mexican-American and Canadian governments have done very poorly, which is to understand that there will be losers as a, as a result of, of free trade, and how do you put in place domestic mechanisms to retrain, to, to create safety networks for displaced labor. And none of the three countries have done this successfully over the 20 plus years of NAFTA. Second, um, an issue which is profoundly domestic in nature in the US, which is how do you solve, how do you resolve a broken immigration system? Um, how do you bring 11 million people out of the shadows, but how do you provide the circular mobility of labor that will allow the US to continue to go. There's a study out there, came out the past couple of days, where it shows that the states and the cities that are growing the fastest are the ones where you have significant 
uh, numbers of, of, of immigrant, uh, immigrants in the labor force. So there's a direct connection there. So, um, and then Mexico has also a responsibility because Mexico's Achilles heel for many, many years now is the narrative that's being created in the U.S. as to corruption, impunity, lack of rule of law in Mexico. And you're not going to solve that by throwing money to, sorry guys, uh, PR firms in Washington, D.C. This is something that is going to have to be solved by sustained efforts by successive Mexican governments to take on the issue of, of lack of rule of law, impunity, and corruption, which have sort of fed into this narrative that has been built on NAFTA and on five million undocumented uh, uh, Mexican migrants living in the U.S. Let's let's just focus on that for a minute because I'd like to get to the kind of get your sense of the Mexican political constraints here. Uh, so one question comes out of that is: Has Trump's harping on these issues that relate to rule of law uh, and in, in Mexico had an impact in a way similar to? getting NATO countries to increase their defence budgets. That is, by, by making such an issue out of it, how does it play in Mexico? Does it incentivise I, I, I dealing think, with the problem I don't or, think it or has creates played a backlash? In, I don't think it has had a, an impact on that debate. I think that what is truly having a, an impact on that debate in Mexico is what I think is one of the most promising um, success stories of recent years in Mexico, which is how civil society, and you saw it, Tony, as an ambassador, how civil society in Mexico, NGOs are starting to play a very muscular role in pushing for accountability. You know, some of these reforms that were enacted a year ago by the Mexican government uh, were born and driven by NGOs coming together and pushing for anti-corruption legislation. So, so I, I think that's much more relevant to the domestic debate than Trump tweeting six months before he uh, announces his candidacy that, you know, he's pissed off at Mexico because he lost two real estate deals and Mexico's corrupt and Mexico should get his money back. If, so I, could, if I could just build on okay, that, but Roger. I also want you to uh, segue from mm -hmm. your reaction to that to the question of the politics on the Hill around the NAFTA uh, renegotiation, if you would. First, on Mexican civil society. I think that the biggest change that I saw in my four years there was increasing activism in civil society, and it started using social media, and then organized civil society groups worked on it, not accepting the corruption that they might have accepted in the past, and demanding higher standards. And this pushed their elected representatives, maybe not as quickly as they would want, but it pushed them to different kind of laws and then different kind of actions. So there's still more to do, but that change was amazing. And that is the, that's what makes governments and societies evolve, is when it comes from within. And so that is really encouraging. Secondly, just to jump back to the United States, um, there's a Gallup poll that came out this week showing 64% of Americans have a favorable view of Mexico. But we don't trust polls anymore. Well, so. <laughs> I do trust Gallup polls <laughs> okay. and Pew polls and a few others. And what that suggested to me is that, in a sense, the more attention to Mexico, people have actually been drawing different conclusions in the majority than a number of the criticisms that have been put out there for a lot of reasons. We could probably and there's go a into backlash, that. and and people are saying, well, you know. That's right. These guys are important to us. Maybe they, they're nicer guys than they're being portrayed. And, and I think that's positive. Can, can I add very quickly to this? Because the counter, the counter story to this is that a poll came out, a Mitovsky poll, uh, which is also a very reliable poll uh, in Mexico, came out in February of this year, uh, comparing uh, uh, year periods, February, February 2016, February 2017. And the counterpart to this jump in positive perceptions in the US regarding Mexico, which I think was triggered a lot by the response from editorial boards and columnists saying, pushing back against some of the looniness of the campaign and the first weeks of the administration. In Mexico, you've got the other story. Um, negative perceptions of the, US, of the US skyrocketed from 22 to 44% in over a year. And the positive perceptions of the US plummeted almost 40 points. So, so you've got two, two different trends playing out here. And again, and, and this talks to how some of the damage may be more in the 
terms of public perceptions than in the day-to-day -day government relationship. So how's that going to play into the politics so, in Mexico? Oh, okay. okay. We'll no, come back ahead. to trade. Let me just, yeah, just go get ahead. an answer, quick answer on this it's, in it's, terms of the presidential elections. It's going to be tricky. Um, if, if, if the three governments, the Canadian, the, the Mexican, and the U.S. governments can pull off the feet, it's going to be a tall order. But if they can pull off the negotiation by December and we can more or less contain... Um, the mischief or the Pandora boxes being opened in the Canadian Parliament, the U.S. Congress, and the Mexican Congress to thumbs up or thumbs down whatever has been discussed by the three governments, and you can prevent this from bleeding into the Mexican presidential campaign, which for all purposes will start late this year. It'll formally start in uh, January, but we will have um, party candidates by November, December. Um, if, if we can prevent this from feeding into the Mexican presidential campaign, then, then I think Sete Dispari was we're going to see, but it's going to be okay. If, if we've got a full-fledged negotiation, a discussion of NAFTA in the midst of a Mexican presidential campaign, that's going to be much trickier. So tell us about what's likely to happen with the NAFTA negotiations and the congressional reaction. Well, I think the good thing is, is that in recent months, you really have had those people who have benefited from NAFTA have the opportunity to go talk to their congressman to explain what those benefits are. And they've become increasingly bold in being willing to say, yeah, there are these good things that happen. Now, that goes along with saying, sure, there are, are things we can mention. As Ambassador Gutierrez said earlier, there are things that can be updated, that can be modernized. It's 20 years old. Everybody, uh, there's a widespread agreement on that. The question is, can we modernize it and not do damage to the economic relationship or to the political relationship in the process? And is there a way, are there ways to better tie it to future job creation? We're all going to go through this fourth industrial revolution. We're all going to go through new technologies coming in and changing how we define work and jobs. So can we work better together between neighbors, three neighbors, to actually take this forward in a positive way, and in that sense sort of redefine, not sort of, really redefine, what is the economic relationship in North America? And, and men, many of us obviously were extremely relieved, but we knew it would probably happen when um, the plans to push the nuclear button by invoking our Article 2205 of, of NAFTA were leaked to the press uh, by some within the White House. Um, it was very important to see the reaction by a very uh, numerous group of GOP senators who immediately came out and said, this, this, is, this is crazy. You have to depend, and you have to defend, and you have to bulletproof uh, what we've achieved through NAFTA. And that, that, I think, was very important. And that plus what we've already talked about here, which is how the ag industry, uh, the, the role that Secretary Purdue has played in this discussion, in this debate, incredibly important in, in sort of putting this conversation and discussion into, into, into context. So let's just talk quickly, because we want to go to the audience, about, about the situation when it comes to uh, drugs and, and guns and, and the war. Um, what's, what's your sense of where that's going to go? Well, I thought the talks last week, which Ambassador Gutierrez mentioned, between the two foreign ministers and the two hom homeland security ministers and others were really important, because what it highlighted was that both sides need the other side. In Mexico, violent deaths have again turned up, and if continued this year at their projection, would set a new record, record for violent homicides in Mexico. In the United States, we have a record of death by opi opioid overdose. A lot of that, the illegal opioids coming from Mexico, because there's been a response in the drug traffickers to the demand in the United States. Last week, when everybody got together to talk about that, the United States came out and said, we have to recognize that we're the market, we're the demand. We've got to change that. In the process, we need to work with our partners in Mexico along this whole chain of production. The Mexican minister said, that's right, we need to work together jointly on that whole chain. Now, this means that you have to trust each other more. You have to build more confidence. You have to have better ways of practical cooperation. During Arturo's Sharing years, intelligence too. During, during my years, we worked that through, but in, precisely in part because of intelligence and other things, 
it's a delicate process. It's going to take trust between the two governments to move to those higher levels of cooperation against really clever but really bad opponents. And it's hard to and build it? and it's very easy to demolish. And do you think it's possible to build trust in this environment, Arturo? I think it is. Um, the problem again is whether the larger context uh, of how uh, uh, Mexico has talked about uh, up here in Washington uh, provides that wiggle room. Because one of the things that we, we've sort of talked about uh, um, in different ways, but um, I'll, I'll call it out as it is, is one of the things that's going to matter is that as this current Mexican government moves into the sunset phase of the administration, uh, as soon as we start heading into the um, political electoral season, the political maneuver maneuverability and, and, and political wiggle room of the president is going to diminish month by month. So things that could have been doable a year ago or acceptable will be less and less the closer we get to the elections. And the rhetoric has also damaged this. And let me give you an example. Um, remember when uh, Homeland Security came out with uh, some of these new directives where there was the mention of uh, non-Mexicans being deported to Mexico across the Mexican-U.S. border. Um, that, you know, you can imagine the uproar that that has created in Mexico uh, and the response, which was logical, which is that's not going to happen. But that took me back to um, the last time that there was a Senate bill on immigration reform. And for those of you who are steeped in the dynamics of comprehensive immigration reform, back in when the Gang of Eight put its bill together, which was the last successful bill that actually got approved in the Senate, there was something called the touchback clause. The idea was that to be able to neutralize the opposition of the hard right to legalization, amnesty, pathway to citizenship, whatever you wanted to call it, you had to do something in providing the 11 million people from all over the world with some sort of status. And so the thinking initially was, well, they have to go back to their countries and then they have to come back with some form of legal document back into the U.S. Very quickly, everyone, everyone understood, you know, if they're Mexicans, it's easy because you're right across the border. But if you're a Filipino, Bangladeshi, a Chinese or an Irishman, um, it gets much more complicated going back and then coming back into the U.S. What we were discussing back then, which I will, which I will describe in a second, today in this context would be absolutely impossible. What we were discussing back then is Mexico is willing to take those 11 million undocumented immigrants from all over the world, across the border into Mexico, from have all them over the world. from all over the world, have them processed in one of the Mexican in one of the U.S. consulates across the border in Mexico, and then have them return in 48, 36 hours to U.S. soil so they can come back in with a legal status. That conversation which we were having with Capitol Hill today. We're going to go to your questions uh, because I'm told that we have to wrap it up because of the schedules of some of the other speakers. I'm just going to take three questions together and get you both to uh, respond to them. Yes, the lady here in green. Please wait for the microphone and please identify yourself and please make sure there's a question mark at the end of your sentence. Hi. Uh, My name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. I'd, I'd like to ask um, the ambassadors, if you could change NAFTA, what would it be, particularly on uh, intellectual property and on access to market? I just have to make a correction here. I don't think the Contessa is from the New York Times. We've had a lot of protest about that. Please go ahead. Hmm. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your discussion. My name is William Preston. I'm with the Rosa and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development. I just wanted to find out your ideals or concepts on sister city programs because there's so many. I'm from California originally, but I've seen so many great successes from the ones I built in Africa. So I just wanted to see if those are soft ways of getting meaningful dialogue and engagement. But without engagement, we got to win the hearts of people on both sides of the border. Thank you and God bless you all. Let's take one from up the back. No, over here. Gentleman with the glasses. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Villalobos. I'm a student at Georgetown University. I have a question specifically for Ambassador Sarukan. Uh, you mentioned the coming election in 2018. There is one specific potential candidate who is highly populationist, highly isolationist. He's already lost two elections. One of them was close enough for it to have been statistical error. 
So um, my question for you is if, if these negotiations are not finished by the time elections roll around and people start uh, campaigning, what can the Mexican people do to avoid the election of a highly isolationist president? And if we are not able to, what does that mean for the future of the bilateral relation? Okay. Well, I'll let you think about that, Arthur. I'll start off. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> I'll, I'll, when, when you talk about the first two, I'll jump in, and then I'll answer the last one. Okay, for sure. So on, on NAFTA, um, I mean, for me, the big new areas should be everything to do with e-commerce, with data flows, um, and services, I think, are another big area that we have not paid enough attention to. Um, and is, is well, all these areas are future growth. That's what is encompassed there. And IPR, intellectual property rights, I think relate to that, to those areas also. And so there's a lot that can benefit all the economies across North America, and we can set global standards in a very positive way. I, I am a big believer in setting norms that others can follow, and we can do that, I think, as part of our modernization of this agreement. On the sister cities and exchanges, I think those are so important. Um, one of the things that I worked on, and I know Arturo worked on, and we continue to work on, are student exchanges, academic exchanges, research exchanges. You can avoid, help avoid so much of this prejudicial rhetoric if people actually know each other in all these kind of interactions they're just going to stand up and say, that's not the Mexico or that's not the United States that I know. I've been there. I've lived there. I know these people. So we have to find ways to keep growing these kind of interactions. That is really important. Um, on, on, on the first two questions, um, uh, the, the, the question, the question would, would have been solved. There would be no question if, the president, uh, if President Trump had not jettisoned TPP. Because TPP, uh, by virtue of having Canada, Mexico, and the United States having agreed to negotiated with their, uh, with our Asian and Latin American Pacific uh, uh, counterparts, uh, precisely chapters and disciplines on uh, data flows, e-commerce, data protection, um, we would have ha had a painless upgrade uh, of NAFTA, which have precluded all of the challenges that we're now facing down the road with a formal. Uh, renegotiation and redo. Let me, let me just interrupt you on that because I heard Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross say that that the administration's going in position is what you accepted on TPP. That, that's fantastic, but do imagine if we would have avoided all of this process if we had TPP, then redoing NAFTA would be um, superfluous because TPP would have modernized the edifice of NAFTA and created a 21st century rules-based international trading system, which is what we're going to end up doing regardless, but with a process that is much more complex and much more vulnerable to congressional um, um, uh, pressures. pressures. Um, on the issue of the and just add in some areas like rules of origin, yeah. actually NAFTA has a higher yeah. than TPP standard yeah. than yeah. TPP has. Yeah. On the issue of the cities, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, in fact, if you look at um, if you look at a map of uh, the cities and states that have their highest trading partners abroad, Mexico, uh, it's very clear that it's between cities and governors on both sides of the border that we need to build. Uh, a new sense of co-stakeholdership. I've always believed that in this relationship, yes, I, I was ambassador in this city for six years, but if you stay in this city, in the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship at least, um, you're shooting yourself in the foot. The role, in part because of the connections that already exist between cities and states uh, across the border, but more importantly, at a time where governments and politics and political parties are being questioned and challenged here in Europe and in South and Latin America, um, it is at the city level where public policy is being reinvented. That's where the conveyor belt between citizens and public policy is real. And if we can create greater connectivity between cities and mayors, I think that's the wave of the future, not only for the international uh, system of the 21st century, but particularly in this uh, uh, bilateral relationship. On <sighs> I, I don't know what you tell Mexicans not to vote for López Obrador. Um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not affiliated to any political party in Mexico, but one of the reasons why being consul general in New York City in 2006, I decided to resign and ask for a leave of absence from the Foreign Service 
was because and and join and accept Felipe Calderon's invitation to join him as his foreign policy advisor and international spokesperson was because I was terrified of how López Obrador understands Mexico's role in the international arena and how he understands a bilateral relationship with the United States. And I don't think that the 12 years that have gone by have changed that dramatically. You just have to look at his positions on Venezuela today to understand what a risk it is uh, for someone that understands Mexico uh, uh, in light of the world of the 19th century uh, uh, and the impact that could have on the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship. So I really hope that the ne negotiation can be wrapped up before the campaign kicks off in Mexico, because then it becomes really complex. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But I have a closeout question for the two ambassadors. Who's going to pay for the war? <laughs> <laughs> Mex Me Mexico and the U.S. have done a lot of great stuff together. We will continue to do a great lot of stuff together. The one thing that we're not going to do together is build a wall. <laughs> That's good. You want to add to that? <laughs> we're going to make the border more efficient and more secure together. <laughs> together. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, both ambassadors.